Well, good morning, friends. Let's stand together as we worship. Come on. Thank you for being with us this morning in the room or online. I want to remind you of our website, hopechristianchurch.com. That's where we're putting a lot of information for you right now. You can also submit your prayer requests on our website. We encourage you to do that. We will pray for you this week. Uh, you can also initiate online giving if you'd like as well, as we're not passing the offering buckets here in the service uh, for now. 
Uh, thank you for registering every Wednesday morning. That starts at 9 a.m. If you'd like to join us for the following Sunday, uh, please be sure to register so we can keep our numbers where they need to be. Some exciting announcements today. First and foremost is our church-wide Bible study uh, that's going to start in the middle of September. We're going to look through the book of Isaiah this fall. And I want to invite you to join us for that. The way this study is going to work is it's, it's flexible. It is going to be a virtual semester, and you can do this for your personal study. You can do this with a friend or two, or you can do it with your small group. However, if you want to join us, you're going to need a daily discipleship guide, and these are available out in the atrium. They're five bucks each. Uh, everyone who wants to participate, we ask you to pick one of these up. Uh, you can go to our website for more details. We're going to have a launch event on September 16th. On Facebook Live, we'll launch the study, and then after that, there'll be weekly uh, teachings to go with this. It's going to be exciting. Please plan to join us for that. I want to tell you about the Kids Kit Pickup Day. And what that is, is our Kids at Hope uh, program, our ministry for the kids here, have decided every month they're going to do a curriculum pickup parade. I think they call it a parade, but uh, they're not saying it, but that's what Chad keeps calling it. So what we're going to do is we're scheduling this time where all the kids can drive through with their parents and pick up the curriculum for the following month. September 2nd is our first one. We want you to sign up on our website. We're registering for that so we know what to prepare for. But what you're going to do is you're going to come through with your kids and you're going to get the month's worth of curriculum for the, the studies, the lessons, some snacks, some treats, some uh, some fun stuff for your kids. We'll do that every month. So be on the lookout for that and be sure to sign up for the first one coming up here this next week. Uh, I want to tell you what something we're doing at CR this Friday. Uh, we've been meeting at CR every Friday. We've resumed meeting on Friday nights, but we haven't resumed dinner. And this Friday, we're going to try something a little different because we miss that fellowship. We're having a sack lunch dinner. We're going to put out some tables and chairs and meet outside, and everyone's just going to bring their own food, and we're going to get some of that fellowship back. So if you've been to CR or you've never been to CR, uh, I want to invite you to join us this Friday, 6 p.m. We're going to hang out outside and have a little, a little time of McDonald's before we have our CR meeting. Uh, finally, I want to tell you about Kayla Glover. Kayla Glover is going to be baptized in the next service uh, at 11 a.m., and we can celebrate that together as a family. Let's stand up. Let's stretch out. Let's get ready to sing our hearts out to our wonderful God. God, you are so good. We just worship you, Lord, with our whole hearts to thank you for what you've done, for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you. I shall hold it to the cross, and I shall hold to God alone for His love and salvation.
Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for buying our price that we had to pay. Thank you for shedding blood on the cross for us. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for splitting the sea so it make it easy for us to walk through.
Father, we rejoice today. We celebrate who you are. We no longer live in fear. That, that was the old us. We are new creations now because of the work of Christ on the cross and what he has accomplished. And you have raised him from the dead. And now you choose to share that righteousness with us. Unworthy as we may be. Father, your glory stands forever. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Go and have your seats. We're gonna celebrate a time of communion now together. If you're at home, go ahead and, and get your elements, some juice and, and a cracker. And if you're here, you can see in the seat in front of you, we have those for you. You know, of anything in the church, I think communion is probably the one thing that ties us the most back to Jesus. Here we are 2,000 years, 2,000 some years after the institution of what we're about to do, we're still doing it. And every Christian church from then until now has celebrated communion in some way. So right now, we draw a line back to Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 26 gives us our Savior instituting what we're about to do. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We take this as a memorial. Christ tells us to do this in remembrance of him. In this memorial, we come with praise and we come with honor and we come with thanksgiving. We remember what Christ did on the cross. We remember the price that was paid for us. And remember that this is why we have a way of hope. If you peel back the first layer, you'll get the bread. As Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. peel back the second layer, you get the juice. And this juice is representative of the blood that was poured out, the blood of the new covenant. Let this moment this morning increase your faith as our faith holds up the cross. So you please take these out with you. There's a garbage can right in the hallway on your way out. If you would be so kind as to take these uh, little cups with you when you go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this invitation into communion this morning that you give us. Communion that, that represents so much and such a simple act. The body that was broken on our behalf. The, the veil that was torn on our behalf, the blood that was poured out on our behalf. 
Father, now we have every reason to have hope and to rejoice, to have joy. May our strength be encouraged. May our strength, may our, our faith be strengthened this morning, Father. Bless our time of worship this morning and, and our hearts now as we prepare to hear God's word. It's in Christ's wonderful name we pray everything this morning. Amen. to all of you here in campus and those of you watching online. It's good to have you with us today. This is the day that the Lord has made and it is good for God's people to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We've had a wonderful opportunity. What a gift it is to sing praises to God together as a church family and then to celebrate communion together. And now we have the wonderful privilege of letting God's word speak to us today. And so we're going to be in Galatians. We're in a series called Galatians. This is a week three of our series. And we've learned so far that the biggest theme in this book is justification by faith. Now, last week, Pastor Mark talked about the word justification. Today, I'm going to hone in on that word faith. And I've titled the message, What is Real Faith? And the reason I did that is it is super important for all of us to have a clear understanding of what genuine faith is. Because faith is the foundation of our salvation. So you can open your Bible or your Bible app to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be in Galatians 3 today. Or you can follow along on the screen here on campus or there at home. Uh, the words will be on your screen as well on whatever tablet you're using or your television screen, whatever. Uh, before we read, I want to give you a little background information about Galatians. Uh, the Apostle Paul, um, this is a little bit of a review here, uh, he wrote the book of Galatians to refute so-called Judaizers. These were Jews who taught that the Gentile believers had to obey the Jewish law in order to be saved. Now, what are Gentiles? Well, that's you and me. Everybody who is not a Jew is a Gentile. So we're Gentiles by virtue of the fact that we are not Jews. Paul wrote this book with a great sense of urgency. Pastor Mark pointed that out last week, and you're going to see this sense of urgency again today as we read along. Paul uses some really strong language here, and rightfully so, uh, because our eternal lives hang on what he is saying about faith. So we really need to, uh, to pay attention to this. It's, it's important, very important. So without further ado, let's read uh, chapter 3. Paul starts out by saying this. He says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So right off the bat, here comes Paul swinging. He certainly doesn't mince words here. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham is one of the most important figures in all of Scripture, apart from Jesus Christ. Abraham, uh, Christ comes from Abraham's lineage. Abraham is the one who was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, uh, when God put him to the test. And the Lord counted Abraham as righteous because of his faith. Abraham put his faith into action, and that pleased God very much. So reading on in verse 7 here, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So what he's saying here is anyone who relies on works is under a curse because it's impossible for every, any human being to do all of the things that God requires in the law. So 
verse 11 here. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who was hanged on a tree or on a cross. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after Abraham does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Well, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Well, certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ... Then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. There's a lot there. In chapter 3, this is what Paul is saying. He's continuing to make the case that faith in Christ is all that's required to be made righteous in God's eyes. The Galatian Christians had believed in Jesus. They began enjoying the freedom they had in Christ. But then along come these Judaizers... These false teachers, they show up, and these guys agreed that it was necessary to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, but they also claimed that non-Jewish people had to follow the law of Moses to be saved. And that is wrong. It's a big error. And that is why Paul is calling them out so strongly. These Judaizers basically had it backwards. Listen to this. They believed that obeying the law led to salvation. But in reality, obedience to the law flows from salvation. There's a big difference there, and I'm going to be explaining that as we go along. Again, Paul is saying here that you've got to have faith in Jesus Christ. This is the way to a right relationship with God. You can't do it on your own merit through works by following the law. Now, if my count is correct, this word faith is used 15 times In Galatians chapter 3 alone, 15 times. So faith is a big deal. Living the authentic Christian life is centered around this one thing, faith. So that's why it's vitally important that we have a proper understanding of this word and what Paul means when he says Abraham's faith was counted to him as righteousness. The question is, what is faith? Or to be more specific, what is faith? saving faith what is real faith because Paul is making it clear that we can have a type of faith that won't save us he's saying here that you can have faith in your works thinking that's what gets you right with God but that is faith built on yourself and in God's eyes that is not faith at all in his word the Bible God makes it very clear that not a single one of us is righteous no not one All of our deeds are as filthy rags. Our good works are as filthy rags. Our own works or obedience to the law could never be enough to satisfy the demands of a holy and just God. Now, the law was given to show us right from wrong 
to be our guardian until Christ came to show us our need for salvation. Now, Paul is saying our faith must not be in ourselves, but instead in the right person, in Jesus Christ. But what does faith really look like? What does it look like? Is it mere belief in God's existence? That can't be because look at James 2, verse 19. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Oh, good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. So this is telling us here that, it, that there must be more to faith than just believing in the existence of God or believing in the existence of Jesus Christ. Many times people have come to me and they've wondered about this issue. They've wondered whether they have true, genuine, saving faith. And I have to tell you that I examine myself on this question. Do I have real faith? And I believe this examination is a healthy thing to do. In fact, Paul says so in his second letter to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians 13.5. Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Right now, I suspect that I'm scaring some of you, and that is really not my intention, not my intention at all. Uh, that's not why I'm showing you this. An examined faith, brothers and sisters, an examined faith brings you joy because it results in an assurance of your salvation. Paul is not calling us here to doubt our faith. What he's calling us to do is to look inside ourselves to see if we have faith. There's a difference. You see that? Doubting your faith shows a lack of faith. The question is, do you really have faith? Do you have saving faith? That's what Paul is saying, and this is a healthy question to ask. And if this uh, causes you to think about your faith and whether it's real, then I can't apologize for that. And obviously, Paul wouldn't do that either. You see what he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. This is really a loving thing to do because nothing is more tragic than people thinking they're saved when they're not because their faith is not a saving faith. We don't want to die. We don't want to come to the end of our lives and come face to face with Jesus and have him say, depart from me. I never knew you. Now, we just saw in James 2.19 that mere belief isn't what saves us. Yet, many verses in the Bible tells, uh, tell us to believe in the Lord Jesus to be saved. Many places in the Bible tell us that. If salvation is based on believing in Christ, how do you know when you've truly believed? Or what does saving belief or faith look like? Well, let me explain it this way. Genuine faith looks like this. And I'm going to use this whiteboard like Pastor Mark did last week because it fits very nicely. You remember he had the top bubble up here and then he had the three bubbles below. Well, I'm going to do the same thing here. And in this top bubble, I'm going to put the words real faith. Real faith. So what is real faith? faith. The Protestant reformers of the 16th century recognized that genuine faith, biblical faith, has three components, three elements. And back then they used the Latin language. And the Latin words for those three components are these. Notitia, N-O-T-I-T-I-A, notitia, the next one is a census. And then the third Latin word is fiducia. So real faith begins with notitia, moves to a census, and ends with fiducia. So what's notitia, a census, and fiducia? Well, I'm glad you asked. Notitia refers to knowledge. A census refers to, what would you think? Ascent. It's not a word that we use very often, ascent. 
but you're going to see that that's the right word for today in just a moment here. And fiducia, fiducia refers to trust. So there you go. Real faith begins with knowledge. It moves to assent and then to trust. Knowledge, assent, trust. Cat for short, not C-A-T, (laughs) K-A-T. Knowledge, assent, trust. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at each one of these words, knowledge, assent, trust, and then I'll tie it all together. Let's begin with knowledge. Simply put, you have to know something in order to be saved. Faith is based on knowledge, and the right believing of the right knowledge is necessary for salvation. You are not saved by information alone, but you can't be saved without it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Pretend you're in a burning building, and the smoke is really thick, and you can't see the exit. And you you call out, where's the exit? And someone responds to you, there's one way out. Go down the hallway, make a left, go through the door, go down one flight of stairs, and the exit will be right there. Are you saved now because you know where the exit is? No. But if you don't know how to get there or if you have wrong information, you're going to die in the fire. You aren't saved by just knowing the truth, but you cannot be saved without it. It's like that with faith. We're called to believe in something, not just anything. Remember, Pastor Mark made it very clear last week that there aren't multiple ways to God. There's one way to God. There's one true God. Genuine saving faith rests solely in what Jesus did for us on the cross. This is what Paul is telling the Galatians and why he talks to them with so so much urgency, so much alarm. Uh, Now, we don't have to be theologians to come to saving faith. We don't have to know everything about the Bible. We don't have to know everything about God. That would be impossible, of course. But we do have to be clear on this, that saving faith rests on what Jesus did, not what we do. We must know this truth in order for our faith to be on the right foundation. Faith in the wrong thing, no matter how sincere you are, won't save you. So saving faith begins here with knowledge, the right knowledge, but it doesn't end there. Knowledge moves to assent. Assent, that's the second ingredient of true faith. Here's the dictionary definition of the word assent from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. An act of agreeing to something, especially after thoughtful consideration. Here's what assent is. Assent is to know something and then to be persuaded that, that it's true. Saving faith requires believing that what the Bible says about Jesus is true. You can know about the Christian faith, and yet you can believe that it's not true. Now, we may have a doubt or two mixed in with our faith at times, but there has to be a certain level of intellectual assent in order to be saved. Here's an example. Let's say a man goes to his doctor, and he's told that he has cancer. That's obviously very bad news. But the doctor says, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a certain type of chemotherapy that is known to be curative with this type of cancer. We can cure you with this chemotherapy. Do you believe that? And you say, yes. Are you cured then? No, not yet. You have to let the doctors pump the medicine into your body, right? But before you'll let them pump the medicine into your body, you have to assent or you have to agree that the chemo is going to work. So so when we're talking about saving faith, that assent is essential. You must be convinced of the truth about Jesus, not just have knowledge about it. But still, that alone is not going to be enough to save you. There is still one more ingredient to genuine faith, and that is this. That is trust. That's trust. Knowing and believing the content of the Christian faith is not enough. Remember, we saw that even the demons can do that. We have to have trust. Trust in the sense of fully relying upon. It's like when you you go to bed at night. You get in your bed and you have full trust. You go to sleep and you have confidence that the bed's going to hold you up all night long. It's like that. True faith rests upon someone or something. And in the Christian life, faith is only genuine if you personally trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. It's one thing to agree that something's true, but quite another to place personal 
trust in it. We can say that we believe that we're saved by faith alone, and yet we can still think that we're going to get to heaven by our good works or achievements or striving. Brothers and sisters, we have to cling to Jesus Christ alone for salvation. We have to put our very lives in his hands. And this is what makes saving faith, saving faith. We make a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. What does a personal commitment to Jesus Christ look like? It looks like this. It's the whole of our being and our mind and our emotions and our will embracing Jesus. What we do, where we go, how we talk, how we think, how we live, where we live, is based on our commitment to Jesus Christ, someone we've never seen. And that's just not natural. Paul has something to say about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So you see, we all have a problem what do we do? It's not what we do. It's what God does. God has to intervene in our lives, and he has to grant us supernatural faith that isn't human and isn't natural. He has to give us the gift of faith. Paul puts it this way in the book of Ephesians. Many of you have seen this many times. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. True saving faith is not something we can get on our own. God has to give it to us. It's a gift. And it's only when we become desperate and see our sinfulness and we see our need for a Savior that the Lord gives us genuine faith, the ability to really trust Christ for salvation. Before I trusted um, Jesus Christ alone for my salvation... I believed that Jesus existed. I believed that he was the son of God. I believed what the Bible said about Jesus. I knew it was true. And that was knowledge and assent. I had knowledge and assent, but I wasn't really trusting him for my salvation. I considered myself a pretty good guy. And besides, I reasoned, Jesus will forgive me for my sins because I believe that he exists. Isn't that what the Bible says? Believe in the Lord Jesus to be saved. But, but trust him with my life? Trust him with my life? Mm. I was the one calling the shots. I, I did what I wanted when I wanted. And I wasn't really, truly sorry for my sins. I wasn't genuinely seeking after God himself. And the truth is, I really knew that something was off. Something deep down told me that I wasn't right with God. It wasn't until I came to terms with the fact that I was a sinner in need of a savior, that I was powerless to change myself. And I cried out for his help that God granted me faith. And then when God granted me or gifted me genuine faith, I received his spirit. And that's when he began to change my heart. You see, until the Holy Spirit changes us, we have hearts of stone. And this came to me late, so you're not going to see these verses up on the screen here. But listen to what Ezekiel chapter 11 says in verses 19 and 20. And I will give them singleness of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will give them. It's a gift. I will take away their stony, stubborn heart and give them a tender, responsive heart. God's giving us that. So they will obey my decrees and regulations. Then they will truly be my people, and I will be their God. You see, the Spirit changes the disposition of our heart so that we see the awesomeness of Jesus and we embrace him. And then instead of loving sin, we hate sin even though we struggle with it to varying degrees throughout our lives, when we do sin, we go to the Lord and we ask for his forgiveness 
and we turn in the opposite direction. We turn away from the sin. And when we do that, the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But brothers and sisters, we don't have the attitude, I know this is wrong, I'm going to do it anyway, God. I know what you're telling me to do. I don't care, I'm going to do it. God forgives, I believe in Jesus. No, we battle against that type of thinking, the type of thinking that I had. We hate sin because of what it did to our Savior and what it does to our relationship with him. And the good works that we do, they flow out of gratitude for what Jesus did for us and is doing for us continually. <clears throat> they don't flow out of our desire to win God's favor or to get to heaven on our own. It is Jesus who saves through his death on the cross to pay for our sins. That's what the Bible says. And our obedience flows out of a grateful heart. I heard one pastor say once, our lives should demonstrate that the faith professed is also possessed. The works don't save us. Jesus alone does, but works will flow from our faith if we love God and are trusting him. This is what genuine faith is. Got a quote from author C.S. Lewis in the book Mere Christianity. I'm reading through that again. And this is a good summation of what I'm saying here. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. He says, to have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you would not take his advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you are trying to obey him, but trying in a new way, a less worried way. Not doing these things in order to be saved, but because he has begun to save you already. Not hoping to get to heaven as a reward for your actions, but inevitably wanting to act in a certain way because a first faint gleam of heaven is already inside you. As we close today, this is my challenge to you. Would you consider this question this week? Is my faith real? Is my faith genuine? Do you know who Jesus is? That he's God's son, that he sacrificed his life on the cross to pay for your sins and mine, do you know that in order to be saved, you have to believe that? That's knowledge. Then do you agree that these things are true? Do you agree there's only one way to be saved, not many ways to God? Do you agree that you cannot find true happiness and the joy that your soul so desperately longs for apart from Jesus Christ. If you do, that's a scent. And then are you clinging to Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Are you demonstrating that you're clinging to Jesus by committing every aspect of your life to him, your finances, your job, your friendships, uh, your marriage, your sex life? Instead of trying to earn favor with God by being good, are you pursuing God himself and showing that by obeying him like Abraham? If you're doing that, then that's trust. And if this is you, if you have knowledge, assent, and trust, then be confident that you've received the gift of faith and that your faith is genuine. Be encouraged today and walk out of this room resolved to live out that faith more and more as Jesus Christ calls you to ever higher levels of trust. And if that's not you today, then be encouraged as well because you have heard this message. You have heard God's word and you still have time to ask God to help you change the direction of your life. The question is how much time do you have? I don't know the answer to that question. Only God knows the answer to that. Do you feel the urgency of this like Paul did when he wrote the book of Galatians? Will you come to Jesus? Will you admit your need for him? Will you commit your life to him? And will you ask him to give you the gift of faith? Galatians 3 tells us 
that without faith we cannot be saved. Our good works are simply not enough. And I want you to know that um, I love talking with people about faith, as do all of our pastors here at Hope. If you have questions about faith and what it means to have a relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with God forever and ever, then send me an email. I'd love um, to hear from you, and I'd love to sit down with you. you. Send me an email and let me know you want to get together, and we'll do that. We won't trade emails back and forth. We'll look, look one another in the eye face-to-face, -face and we'll talk about faith. My name is Bob Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, like the Bauer Ice Skates. I don't have a stake in the company. I wish I did. <laughs> But it's very simple to remember my email address. It's Bob Bauer, all run together, B-O-B-B-A-U-E-R, at hopechristianchurch.com. And my prayer for you this week is, is that as you examine yourselves, that you'll find that you have genuine faith. And uh, if you examine yourselves and you find that you don't have genuine faith, then my prayer for you this week will be, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Let's pray. Oh, Father, your word says that I can't save myself, and there's nothing that I can do to be worthy of salvation. And my prayer today is that not a soul here will miss out on saving faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we all embrace Christ. And as we do, Father, may our faith totally transform us so that our stony hearts will be hearts of flesh that seek to do what you say, to honor you for all that you've done and are continuing to do for us every second of our lives. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Hope you have a great week. See you next week.